Artifacts can be incredibly fun because they provide effects and abilities unlike anything else in Dungeons & Dragons. In our last video where we talked about the top 10 coolest magic items in the game, we covered artifacts that made you completely immortal, changed the very world around you, birth baby elementals, we even covered an artifact that could split metaphysical concepts. Today, however, we will take some steps in a different direction. Instead of focusing on artifacts that are fun and interesting, we're going to talk about artifacts that can completely dismantle the world as you know it. Artifacts that, if in circulation, could either spell doom or salvation to the world. Artifacts that, if found by adventurers during a quest, could turn them into either the greatest heroes of the world or the greatest villains the multiverse has ever seen. This is going to be one of probably multiple videos that I will be doing on this topic since there are many strong magical artifacts and many of them fill the quota that I have just laid out. But without further ado, let's begin. Number 5. The Infinity Spindle. This artifact looks like a crystalline shard and it comes from the early days of the multiverse. Its abilities are not described fully, but what we know is that it has the capabilities of turning even the lowliest of monsters or humanoids into completely and fully formed demigods. The story goes that there was once a creature named Raxivort who served the demon lord Grasts as treasurer. It goes, quote, Raxivort spent long centuries watching over the treasury and in time he grew too lost after his master's riches. In one bold move, he plundered a treasure vault and fled to the material plane. One of the treasures he stole was the Infinity Spindle that could transform even a creature as low as Raxivort into a demigod. As he ascended to godhood, Raxivort forged a realm called the Black Sewers within Pandesmos, the topmost layer of Pandemonium. He enjoyed his divine ascension only briefly though, before Grast unleashed his vengeance. The Demon Prince had no need to regain the Infinity Spindle, since he already possessed power greater than that it could grant. Instead, he dispatched agents far and wide to spread news of what the Spindle could do and the puny pathetic creature that claimed its ownership. Soon enough, Raxivort was pursued by a variety of enemies, all eager to claim the spindle as their own." End quote. Because Raxivort knew that he could not survive being hunted in this fashion, he created the race of Svarts, which is an entire race that literally all look like clones of him. He did this so that every single divination spell or magic used to locate him would instead target the nearest Svart. So now, because of him, the multiverse is filled with this degenerate offspring that are all clones and look alike, and Raxivort is believed to still be wandering the plains, never staying in one place in fear that he will be hunted and someone else will steal the Infinity Spindle from him and become a demigod. Number 4. The Jathaman Dagger. The dagger that can slay gods. Dungeons and Dragons, specifically the Forgotten Realms, has a very cliché story where thousands of years ago there used to be a magically advanced civilization that perished because they abused their overpowered magic. The civilization was called the Netherese and they existed around where the desert of Anorak is located. Well, in that civilization there was a group of people that called themselves the Cult of Jathamon. The Jathamites hated the gods and thought that the gods could be killed by sheer force if only the right weapon was created for the job and as such they went on to attempt this very thing. By weaving powerful arcane magic and through the sacrifice of 39 Jathamites, they accomplished the creation of the powerful artifact, the Jathaman Dagger, a plus 5 unholy dagger. More so than that, the dagger had the special ability to penetrate all protections a target would have by virtue of being divine or by being a god. It was also said that it had special properties that would manipulate the fates of divine beings. Through fate and circumstance, the blade would be found wielded by Bane, god of fear, hatred, and tyranny, though this was when Bane was a mortal, before he was a god. See, with this dagger, mortal Bane killed the god Borum, and through this murder, Bane was granted power that turned him into a god. Now, this blade has only been used once, and it did everything it was meant to do. It completely killed a god and allowed the wielder to become one. The dagger is still, to this day, stuck to the heart of Borum, which is currently buried deep in a mysterious island off of the coast of Sembia, at a site marked by a menhir. 
It is said that if the dagger were to be ever removed from the heart, the heart would spew forth warm and muddy water that after 30 days would reform into the god Borum reborn. Though you could simply pluck the heart closed to prevent this, though it would take great raw strength to be able to do that. Also, the location of the heart and the dagger in the island is completely secret and probably only the dead three, Bane, Ball, and Merkel, would know of the location that I have just described. So, keep it secret. So nobody else is supposed to know that. Number three. The Scepter of Savras, the strongest god-binding artifact. The scepter is named the Scepter of Savras, not because it was owned by Savras, god of divination, but because it actually bound the god Savras inside of it. The staff was actually made by Asseth, god of wizards, in order to fight Savras for dominion over the pantheon of wizards and magic. See, Overlord Ao, the god of gods, eventually made rules against this sort of thing, but back then, gods used to fight all the time in order to get better and stronger portfolios. See, Asseth was the god of wizards, sure, but Savras was the god of divination magic, and if Asseth could get divination magic into his portfolio, oh, then he would be stronger, and so they fought. In order to prepare for this battle, Asseth created, using his considerable godly power, an incredible staff that could hold the essence of a god within it, with the purposes of tapping from the magic of said god in order to bolster the magic and abilities of the wielder. Now, this is already very impressive. Finding vaults of any kind that can hold the full essence of a god is just very rare, but more so than that, finding a vault that can hold a god without easily breaking is even harder. But what's even more impressive is that all the wielder had to do in order to imprison a god within the staff was to literally just strike the god with the staff. That was it. If you struck a god with the staff, the god would be imprisoned within it and without a way out. Now, stuck within the staff, a couple of things would happen. Being stuck in the staff would completely prevent that god from being able to interact with the realm from where he was caught. So if he was caught in the Forgotten Realms, then all of his clerics in the Forgotten Realms would lose their powers. And if the god only had a presence in this world, then he would starve out and eventually die because all gods need followers to survive. However, if the god had a presence in other worlds, then he would continue to exist and may even use those connections in other worlds to try to get some support in order to save him. Now, while the god was stuck in the staff, the staff would inevitably absorb a lot of the god's power, which could be used by the wearer of the staff for his own benefit, and the staff would gain properties similar to that of the god. In the case of the Scepter of Savras, the staff's crystal ball would look like the symbol of Savras, a crystal ball with eyes. Now, because Savras is the god of divination, he literally has the top most power of divination in the entirety of Dungeons and Dragons. When it comes to divination, I mean, he is the man. This ability was conferred to the wielder of the staff, which in this case allowed the wielder to perform the most overpowered divination known to the whole lore of Dungeons and Dragons. The wielder, check this out, could scry into any place in the prime material realm, into the lower and into the higher planes, without any repercussion and without any danger. Some gods could block this, but many couldn't, so you could literally scry into any pantheon of gods and see what they were up to, and you even got this special ability to read the minds of those you were scrying into, including gods. You could mind read divinity with the Staff of Savras, and because of the special ability of the Staff, they wouldn't even know that it was happening. It was actually broken. Asseth eventually released Savras from the artifact, and both have become colleagues in heaven since then. But the staff permanently absorbed a great amount of magic off of Savras, so it still retains its powers. Currently, the staff has vanished, as many artifacts end up doing eventually, and nobody knows where it currently resides. The staff could imprison within its crystal any mortal as well as any god, and any person could use this ability. However, only a divine or a person with divine properties could release whoever was stuck inside by simply saying the true name of the individual three times while striking the ground with the staff. It is said that this artifact could only ever be destroyed by Asseth himself. Number 2. The Living Gate 
the opening to the world of horrors. In essence, this is the door to Cthulhu. This is the entrance and exit that joins the Far Realm to our reality. The Far Realm, for those of you who don't know, is essentially an existence of horror, of tentacled monsters, of beings far greater than most gods whose very visage would drive you mad. It's the place where beholders, mind flayers, and avalets come from. It's basically a realm of Lovecraftian horror that would drive you mad if you were to witness it. The Living Gate is the only known permanent opening between our reality and the Far Realm, where theoretically any being could freely cross from one side to the other. The Gate is called the Living Gate because the opening itself is made of a fleshy substance which seeped an oozing liquid that transforms the surrounding world into a nightmare. There are only two of these gates that have been known to exist. One of them, however, is more of a myth than anything else. The legends say that there used to be a living gate in the far reaches of the astral plane that had to be destroyed by the gods because of a massive invasion by the far realm. The leftover fragments of this particular living gate still drift through the plane and are actually used as a material component in the creation of the silver swords used by the Githyanki. Utilizing these fragments is said to grant the gift the ability to sense incoming rips in the fabric of reality where the far realm seeps through. This is why the Githyanki are always incredibly fast in responding to far realm invasions, and why they are so good at sensing the mind flayers. There is however a living gate still complete to this day, and its location is actually in the Feywild, though more specifically in the Fey Dark. See, the Feywild is supposed to be a fantastic mirror to the Prime Material Plane, so if there is an Underdark in the Prime, there is an Underdark in the Feywild, though of course they call it the Fey Dark, and this is where creatures like the Fomorians come from. The Living Gate lies beneath the beautiful ruined city of Sendrion, and it is said to have been the most beautiful city of the Eladrin, made of crystal spires. This picture from the player's handbook is actually a picture of adventurers investigating the ruins of Sendrion. Beneath the city, in a secret section, lies the Living Gate, which is currently sealed and protected by Eladrin knights appointed by the Summer Queen of the Fae, Titania, specifically to prevent anyone from unsealing the artifact. The gate is said to be so tiny that its diameter is measured in eyelashes. Number 1. The Nether Scrolls, the answer to the question of magic. The Nether Scrolls were an artifact meant to collect magical information from the world and consolidate it all into a single location. To put it simply, what if we could gather all of the magical knowledge of every wizard and just put it all into an easily digestible book? Well, that's the essence of it. The story says that the first empire of the world, the Empire of the Serpentine Serox, wanted to accomplish this very thing, and so they created and devised the Nether Scrolls. Back then, the Serox basically owned the entirety of the continent in their empire, and so they combined all of the knowledge of their vast empire into these scrolls. Now, there are 50 scrolls, all comprising 5 chapters, so to read a chapter, you needed to read 10 scrolls. Now, the magic of the scrolls made it so that the subject of the scroll shifted depending on who was reading it, so as to make it both easier on the reader, but also to allow the reader to learn what he would be most capable of learning. So, for example, a thieving halfling might be given a lot more information about illusion magic rather than necromantic magic, since he would be able to pick up the former a lot quicker and it would be more useful to him. The first chapter was called Arcanus Fundare, and it talked about the fundamentals of magic. It basically, anything that had to do with magic in general, how it works, how to cast it, and how to understand its flow in the world. Those who would read it would essentially understand magic in such a fundamental way that it would allow them to match or surpass true masters. Essentially, this allowed you to learn spells to up to 9th level. The second chapter was called Magicus Creare, and it dealt with magic item creation. Reading this would teach you on how to create magic items easily. The third chapter was called Mayor Creare, and it dealt with the creation of constructs or more complex magical objects. 
Reading this chapter would allow you to create golems and many more interesting magical constructions. The fourth chapter was called Planus Mechanus, or the studies of the planes. It dealt with the understanding of the cosmos and the planes of reality. The reader would understand how not to suffer any of the negative effects from existing in these other planes and how to get there, and how the planes interacted with one another. And then lastly, the chapter Ars Factum, or Of the Creation of Artifacts. This chapter's scrolls required a specific key to be read, and by the time of their creation, it was never understood how to unlock its contents. See, the chapters could be reread multiple times, and you would actually get different things each time you would read them, and sometimes you would unlock hidden important information as you reread the scrolls. The key into actually unlocking some of the secret knowledge was to shift your point of view, the way you see things. See, most wizards would only use their eyes in order to absorb the contents of the scroll. By reading the scrolls, you're only using one of your senses, your, your eyes. But if you were to magically alter the scrolls into other shapes, you could further unlock its hidden potentials. So for example, if you were to magically shift the scrolls into braille form and use your hands to read, you would unlock hidden parts of the knowledge. This was a secret factoid of the Nether Scrolls that many actually missed. The scrolls were so incredibly powerful that they single-handedly created the magical rise of the greatest empire of men in the world of the Forgotten Realms, the Empire of the Netherese. It was actually through these scrolls that they managed to reach the heights that they did, which eventually led to them being able to unlock the secrets of 10th, 11th, and 12th level spells. In fact, most of our understanding of magical theory nowadays come from the scrolls, and without them, it is believed that we would still be struggling to cast even 5th level spells. Eventually, the elves stole the scrolls from the humans of the Netherese Empire, and instead, they transformed the scrolls using high magic into a beautiful tree called the Quest Ar Taranthvar, or the Golden Grove of Hidden Knowledge. The tree was a golden beech tree, with golden metal leaves and with its trunk in the face of a treant. In the tree's foliage, there was a small silver bird and a snake with golden silver and electrum scales. In order to unlock all of the secrets of the Nether Scrolls, the elves used the tree to enhance their perception of the scrolls, so that they weren't just using their eyes to read, but they were actually using many more senses. See, by analyzing the shape and structure of the roots, they could read into the shapes and learn the first chapter. By reading the patterns and shapes of the leaves, they could learn the second chapter. By listening to the animals in the tree, they learned many secrets of the third chapter which you could not learn by simply reading. For example, in this chapter, they learned of the secrets of living self-sustained magical fields, as well as wild magic and dead magic. Now, by listening to the rustling of the leaves, they could learn the fourth chapter. Then, when the entire grove contorted its bark and branches into symbols along with the melodies of the leaves and animals singing in concert, they could understand and have revealed the true extent of the fifth chapter, and then they could understand the artifacts and their creation including a secret section within that chapter that allowed them to create new magical life forms, like the creation of monsters and new living beings. Finally, once the reader had understood all of these five chapters, a sixth chapter could be unearthed, but that only happened when the snake and the bird that formed part of the grove merged together into the form of a small golden dragon. This form taught the elves the upper levels of the weave, which granted them access to 10th and 11th level spells as well as the secrets of high magic rituals. As of the present day, the tree had to be destroyed because it was ripped out and stolen by evil human shades. As the tree was destroyed, it returned into its normal scroll shapes. The scrolls were, however, recuperated and then scattered to the winds so that they could not be found. Thank you guys so much for watching. I would like to personally thank my Patreon supporters Walker Motley, Zach Bowell, Rocato Fan, Barry Mascant, 5E Magic Shop, Daniel Umar, Rusty Rain, Morgan Johnson, Biotechnofrag, Daniel Luna, Doc Feeder, The Great Codini, Terry Culp, Baracus Law, Omega Scales, Carathas de Bulwark. Ozol, Soundtech, Siri, Alex Cookson, Square Chicken, Ariel Nelson, Benjamin Busters, IO is Awesome, Falk 951, Jacob Crazed, 
Griffin Pierce, Morbid Magician, and Siron King for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash MrRex to support. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please, please, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure that you're subscribed. It's incredible that over 60 or 70% of my viewers are not subscribed. I please implore you guys to do so. Then you can receive my videos more often and then you can watch them or, or not if you don't really want to. But please do that if you haven't already. And I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.